Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. We must share together the bad news and the good news, the defeats and the victories, the changing fortunes of war. By the time Roosevelt uttered those fateful words, there was no doubt that the United States was in it for the long haul. While Pearl Harbor may have been the U.S.'s official invitation to World War II, America had already been active behind the scenes for some time. While publicly maintaining a neutral stance on the war, America had been helping to supply their British allies with much needed cargo to survive the German Nazi onslaught. One of the most critical needs of the British Army was airplanes, and this was one thing that Americans knew how to build. But building them wasn't the problem. The problem was transporting them 3,000 miles across the icy Atlantic Ocean where they were needed. So how did the Allied forces solve this logistical nightmare? On this episode of Destination Anywhere, we're going to see how a daring plan changed history and made legends out of men. As any student of World War II knows, air combat played a significant role in deciding the outcome of the conflict. By the time the Battle of Britain played out in the summer of 1940, it was clear that having the superior air force would be paramount to winning the war. With both the Germans and the British losing nearly 2,000 aircraft apiece, the need to usher replacements to the front lines became crucial to the war effort. Luckily for the Brits, their American and Canadian allies to the west were willing and able to provide new aircraft and had already taken orders for over 10,000 since the war had started. Besides taking the orders, they had already successfully shipped over 200 Lockheed Hudsons across the Atlantic for use in battle. As the orders flooded in, it quickly became apparent that the allies would need a new method for delivering these shiny new aircraft. With shipping space at a premium and Nazi submarines circling the waters of the North Atlantic, boxing up an airplane for this slow, dangerous trip across the ocean seemed like less than a stellar approach. It was at this point a decision was made to attempt a method that was once unthinkable, flying the planes themselves across the ocean one by one. The plan to ferry the planes would go like this. The planes would be built on the West Coast in places like Burbank, California or Seattle, Washington. Once they were finished, pilots would fly them to the Canadian line before they were landed and towed across the border. Don't forget, America was still not in the war. Then the pilots would fly the rest of the way to Canadian bases such as in Montreal. Next, the planes were altered with long-range flying kits that included an extra gas tank and oxygen equipment. Once ready to go, they would fly to the Newfoundland airport, known more commonly as just Gander, to make a trip from there to the British Isles. The next obstacle in making the ferry operation a success was finding enough pilots. With most qualified British pilots already flying over Europe in combat, and the US still nearly a year away from entering the war, who would fly these planes across the ocean? As word spread through aviation circles in the fall of 1940, pilots came from all over for the good pay being offered. There were crop dusters and sky riders and bush pilots from all over North America vying to help the war effort. One of these civilians was Marty Wetzel from Jamesburg, New Jersey. Marty was 28 when he left the Garden State to begin this adventure, but he was quite a Renaissance man already. Besides being a pilot and owner of Jamesburg Airport, he had spent time in the ring as a welterweight boxing his way across the Northeast. He was also an accomplished musician who toured the area with an orchestra and sat on a local Democratic committee in the area. On top of all that, he ran a nightclub in Jamesburg and was a building contractor during the day. While Marty left for training in Ottawa in late September of 1940, 
the first batch of planes would cross the Atlantic by November. Although there were some bumps along the way, and the planes had trouble staying in formation, they all made it safely through the dark and cold northern Atlantic night to Belfast without accident. While it would seem like a cause for celebration, the secrecy of it prevented that and they were headed back to Canada aboard a ship just hours later. While unheralded at the time, the brave men on this first journey had changed the course of the war and eventually modern air travel. The ferrying of airplanes would continue into 1941 with mostly positive results with the exception of a crash in February that killed one of the founders of insulin, Sir Frederick Banting. As the transatlantic flights became accepted and even regarded as safe, it wasn't uncommon for people of high influence to request space on a flight. This was exactly how Banting lost his life after engine failure struck the Hudson T9449 he was a passenger in. The next big advancement began in May of 1941 as the return ferry service started that would fly crews of pilots back to Montreal avoiding the slow return of the high seas. By the summer of 1941, the ferry service, under the name of At Faro, or Atlantic Ferry Organization, was still not moving enough planes, and that's when Roosevelt and Churchill finally stepped in. The new plan was to have the US military pilot all planes from the factory to the North American takeoff point. This would free up all civilian pilots for use in the ferrying operation across the Atlantic, as well as any Royal Air Force pilots being used. On July 20th, 1941, the Royal Air Force Ferry Command officially began under the direction of Air Chief Marshal Sir Frederick Bowhill. The BOAC, or British Overseas Airways Corporation, would handle the return ferry service and in essence became the first transatlantic commercial airline, bringing not just pilots west, but also mail and other dignitaries needing a quick trip to North America. While the operational shift proved effective in that nearly 600 planes made the Atlantic voyage in 1941, it wasn't without a toll. On August 14th, the Liberator AM260 readied for takeoff at RAF Heathfield Aerodrome in Prestwick, Scotland. The return flight to Montreal was set for takeoff at 1900 hours. However, the takeoff was delayed because of the last minute addition of Arthur Purvis, one of the premier men in charge of purchasing war materials in America on behalf of Britain. When it was finally time for takeoff, AM260 taxied over to runway 36. As it headed north, the airplane was supposed to turn right down runway 14, the longer of the two. Instead, the aircraft continued down the initial runway to point six. Somewhere around point six, it's reported that a fellow pilot tried to signal to the AM260 that it appeared to be aimed down the wrong runway. To the surprise of all witnesses, the pilot of AM260 pushed the engines ahead down the short runway. The AM260 would soon veer off course without picking up the altitude needed to successfully lift off. Within seconds, the aircraft was reduced to fiery wreckage outside the boundary of the aerodrome. The intense heat of the damaged plane prevented the rescue of all but First Officer Earl Watson, who was rescued but died later in the hospital. In all, 22 lives were lost, including Arthur Purvis and my great uncle, Marty Wetzel. The official investigation report would blame pilot error for the accident. Working a steady stream of transatlantic flights leading up to the tragedy, it's believed that fatigue could have played a part in the lapse in judgment that caused the pilot to use the wrong runway and also not let off the engines when it was clear that the takeoff would fail. Unfortunately, this wasn't the only accident as an outbound Liberator crashed just four days before the AM260 not far from takeoff in this rocky area. Just like the other crash, this one would claim 22 lives as well. These accidents left the RA Ferry Command shaken. However, determined to trudge on, the operation held steadfast, and by the end of the war, nearly 10,000 aircraft had been ferried across the Atlantic Ocean through one organization or another. While Allied victory in World War II can be pinned on any number of factors, there's no denying the pivotal role that the ferry service played in keeping fresh planes on the front lines. 
Besides the brave pilots that faced down the dark and unforgiving conditions of the North Atlantic, there were over 10,000 mechanics, aviation experts, and other personnel that deserve credit for making this impossible dream a reality. Not only did they prove that the North Atlantic could be navigated by air, they showed that it could be done safely and in turn set the tone for transatlantic commercial aviation as we know it today. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Destination Anywhere. On our way out this time, let's pay respects to the whole crew that lost their lives in the Liberator AM260 flight on August 14th, 1941. 